You have to be where you want to be in order to make the things happen. Believe in yourself. Know fully what you want. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the FYI podcast, Finding Your Inspiration, where we find the inspiration and we follow it. We're here today with our uh, awesome talented guest, Cynthia Quiles. Cynthia, thank Hi. you for coming. Yes, thanks for having me. <laughs> I've known Cynthia for a few years now. Um, Cynthia is an incredible actress, uh, mother, so many other things, entrepreneur. So we're going to kind of get to know her. Um, but yeah, I know actually nothing about where you're from. Like, well, tell me about where I was born in Puerto Rico, in Arecibo, and I grew up on the East Coast from New York down to Miami. I went to high school in the Carolinas which was an experience in and of itself. And then I moved to California probably about 15 years ago by way of San Francisco and then uh, Los Angeles. Oh, wow. So you've so kind I've, of I've lived. I've been around. All right. I've See, I'm around. over here thinking you were from Cali. Nope. Not so, an East Coast girl. So Puerto Rico originally. What part of Puerto Rico? Arecibo. I was born Arecibo. in Arecibo and then we moved from there to New Jersey, New York. And then from there uh, to the Carolinas. Wow. Which was quite interesting so growing up in the carolinas there's two colors there's white and there's black and there's nothing in between so for me growing up the question that i got asked the most was are, are you white or are you black and wow. it was like you had two choices and i was like well neither i was born in puerto rico with this i guess strategy of pretending that I was white. He really wanted me to pretend that I was white. He wanted me to, on my driver's license, put that I was white. Don't tell anybody that you're Hispanic because they're going to, you know, discriminate wow. against you. So it was an interesting journey growing up. And then that era of self-discovery after I was, you know, old enough to make my own decisions, obviously, that I was like, no, I'm, this is who I am. I'm not going to deny this for other people's acceptance. So for me, growing up in the South was a little bit, uh, complicated, I guess, in that way. Yeah. Um, so then at 14 years old, I took a trip to Miami Beach where it was open-minded and it was like gays dancing on the beach and like this great vibe. And I'm like, this is it. This is where I want to be. So I went back to North Carolina. I graduated high school at 16, two years early, um, valedictorian, top of my class. And I moved to Miami Beach on my own. And that's where the rest of the story started, I guess. I got out of the conservative small town mindset and moved to South Beach, and that was that, yeah. Wow, I definitely want to jump into that because I know there's stories there. So, but before we jump in, what did your parents do for a living? Um, so my mom is a, an entrepreneur. She's always owned her own businesses. She's a, a tax preparer now, but also she provides legal services. My father, growing up, worked as a manufacturing manager at um, a factory and always wanted to be a police officer. And at the age of 42, went through the police academy, the oldest in his class, after his kids were up and out and became a police officer. That's incredible. So for, for the audience listening out there, I mean, right, this is uh, finding your inspiration. So like dreams could start really wherever they're at, just finding what you enjoy to do and going to get it. So sure. I just want to take a quick time out to shout out your dad yeah. for that and your mom for being an entrepreneur, but uh, yeah, chasing his dream. Yeah, she held it down. So you went to South Beach. Now let's get into the, uh, South Beach. we know South Beach gets, gets wild. So South Beach does get wild and I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> That's for sure. I worked in all the clubs, uh, worked up and down Ocean Drive. I loved it because I had an opportunity to, uh, we had to take dance classes in order to know the routines of the performances. So for me, it was actually one of my segues into being a performer. You know, that's why ah. I loved working in the nightclub and the whole like experience of, you know, training, I guess. And But after about three years, the city kind of chewed me up and spit me out. And I was like, all right, I think I need to try uh, other <laughs> things. I had started working at a modeling agency there, um, assisting the president of the agency. And one of the guys within the company was like, you should audition. I caught the bug at that point. Nice. So one day after a wild weekend or who knows, I mean, Miami was just so every day was a wild day in Miami. <laughs> I was driving and I heard um, a Nelly Furtado song. It was track seven on her CD. And she says, I left my heart in San Francisco on a crowded street with some club kids. 
And I said, I'm moving to San Francisco. I heard it and I had never been to California. And so I took the leap. I called my boyfriend at the time and was like, what do you think about San Francisco? And he's like, sure, let's do it. So we uh, came to San Francisco for like five days. I saw it, this was in March. And by July, I was moving out. Wow. Which is a crazy story in and of itself. That's so crazy. <laughs> I shared this with somebody recently. So this is the days of like Craigslist and stuff. And I found this sublet and it was like $1,100 for one month. And I arranged everything on email. This is like young, naive uh, me. I sent my thousand dollars. The lady sent me a key in the box and we <laughs> got rid of the apartment, got a Penske truck and drove across the country and whatever. And I got to San Francisco and I put the key in and I opened it. <laughs> and it was this beautiful unit with this like fire is getting gorgeous. It was like living in paradise for a month. But I think now, how crazy was I that I sold everything off of just like a key in the mail? Somebody could have totally taken advantage. I thought you were gonna be like, I got there and no. the key didn't fit. No, it worked. It worked. But so I'm like, it was amazing. legit. It was legit. It was legit, and it was a great experience to. And your boyfriend just picked up and rolled with you. He was looking at art schools at the time, and so he was like, Yeah, we can go to Academy of Art in San Francisco. Wow. And so it worked out. We popped off and went to California. So that intuition. Right? You're listening to Nelly Furtado, yeah. right? Whatever you're going through in your life, you're like, man, I, I'm I, I, dancing. This isn't yeah. going to last forever. It yeah. was fun for... And it's just you, you get this intuition, you follow it. Yep. You know, we say uh, find your inspiration and follow it's it, true. right? So, so you followed it. You end up in Frisco. What's that lead to? You're here now. Well, I mean, what's the first thing? Oh, How do you make money? Okay, how do I make money? It was scouring Craigslist once again, which is the savior of like everything, right? You find your place, you find your job, you find your pets, everything, your roommates on Craigslist. Uh, so I found a job. I started working in property management. Um, I got hired as the receptionist and within two weeks I got called to the back and I was like, oh my God, I'm getting fired. And the girl who had been the receptionist had become an admin assistant, she had promoted up. And the president of the company was like, you're too smart to be the receptionist. I'm gonna make you my assistant. She's gonna go back to being the receptionist. And I got moved to the corner office with a view of all of San Francisco and I became his right hand. And he trained me to become a licensed and certified property manager in the state of California. Um, I had a portfolio of about a thousand units and I started acting. My boyfriend, who I went to San Francisco with, was no longer my boyfriend, but uh, still an artist, was doing short films for the Academy of Art. And he asked me to start helping out in them, and I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. So I read every book I could on the business of acting, I researched how to get an agent, I got into acting classes, and I started auditioning, and I was booking one after the next. And it was like March, I was booked till November, film after film after film in San Francisco doing wow. indies, and I thought I could just be the indie queen, and this could be great. Um, but then of course you want more. And I'm like, if I'm doing this great in San Francisco, I'm gonna kill it in LA. And then you come to LA and you wonder if the phone is still in service because nobody's calling you. You're like, what is going on? It's a different beast. Right. Um, and I had to, I was flying in for auditions from San Francisco at one point, booking last minute travel for a note, which I do not recommend anybody who's watching, don't do that. Cause your bank account will dwindle to nothing. You have to be where you want to be in order to make the things happen. So, I mean, I had a situation once that I flew in and got to the audition, was waiting to be seen, and the gentleman came out and was like, oh, I'm so sorry, we cast that part this morning. And I drove back to the airport, uh, returned my rental car, and spent all this money for, for nothing. Right. So it was, it was definitely the wake-up call to be living in Los Angeles. So I did, I made the move. What do you think that is about some people? It's like you put you put the, the energy in like, okay, I'm going to Miami, you get there, boom. Uh, you find these clubs, yeah, I'm gonna learn how to dance. Mm -hmm. You're gonna you're gonna be great at whatever you do. You yes. go to San Francisco, property management, like what a completely different, yeah. you know, and, and, and you nail it and people wanna work with you and, and you hold yourself in this like management type of walk anyways, mm -hmm. the way you carry yourself, take care of yourself. So what do you think that is, is that natural? Did that, is something happen in life that, that made you wanna excel? Um, I'm going to say it's a combination of my personality and my mom. My mom mm. made everything happen on her own. I mean, I grew up, my mom would, you know, now she's this businesswoman, I told you what she does, but she would sell things, whether it was making buttons or random things at the flea market. And, you know, on the weekend, I would be five o'clock in the morning in the backseat of the car while she was selling 
thing. She was a hustler. My mom, like, there was no stopping her. My mm. parents had nothing. Now they own a fleet of vehicles and houses all over the country. I wow. mean, they really come up, but like, they, and my father as well, you know, we would go looking at model homes on Sunday, like nice houses and, I'm, you know, things that seemed out of the realm of possibility. And he's like, you have to see it in order to make it happen, mm. you know? And I live by that. Like, you tell me what it is that you want in life. I'll tell you what I want in life and we'll find a way to get there. I think everything is figure outable. We can figure out that path. So I got that from them, but also just who I am as a person. As a little girl, if I wanted to go to Disney, I would create a pitch for my parents and say, I want to go to Disney. This is the best hotel. This is how much the tickets are going to cost. This is how much the gas is going to cost. We're going to eat here. And I'd be like, will you take me to Disney? And usually they would say yes, because I did all that work. So, so that was me. But again, that came from the way that I was raised. I had a conversation with, uh, with, with a friend recently about where do we think that change starts? Where do we evoke change? Is it is it, for example, um, we were talking about nutrition. Is it the school's responsibility or does it start at home? And you know, my, my train of thought is everything starts at home. 100%. That's where it has to begin. It's not for the child, this is for the parents listening. It's so important for us to go that extra mile and, and, and instill that hustle in the kids young and, and, and that drive because they're watching and they're, they're, they're soaking up what we do. As a, I would love to live in a society where it was just like everybody was go-getters, like oh, hungry. Like imagine where we could be without that going like to a crazy place, but if everybody was overachievers, yeah. like in fitness and health and, and, and work and if we helped each other and it, it's like, it'd be insane it would be if awesome. there was a society of Cynthia Aquiles here. So, so let, let's jump into LA. So now you come, the, you come with the, the big boys and girls. You I come did. to LA, the, the home leagues. of the actors, the major leagues. Yep. Uh, everybody comes here with a dream and we all feel like we got this. Yep. How's that start? Uh, how did it start? Uh, it was getting... a bumpy road. I mean, I had, you know, the, everybody's story. I had an agent that I thought was more powerful than they were. And then you get up further down your career and you're like, that agent had zero pool. <laughs> zero pool. <laughs> I mean, I had an agent once tell me, uh, you don't have a good look for commercials. I, I don't really see you in commercials, you know, just stick to theatrical. And, and I believed him wow. because that's what I wanted to be the leading lady. So I was like, that's right. I'm I'm not good for commercials. And, you know, I, he ended up closing the agency. I, I thought he was, you know, a, a pro in the field and he threw in the towel. And about a year later, I booked a national commercial that paid me over $200,000. And I think if I would have listened to the advice of that bad agent, right. I would have cost myself that opportunity. But so, I mean, through those experiences, I learned that you really have to be number one, your own advocate. You don't let anybody tell you what you can and cannot do. Um, and you have to believe in yourself. So around 2019, I would say I kind of, I had this wake up again, another intuition moment, um, I was going through some stuff and like the word manifestation popped in my mind and I was like, I don't even, it was like a conversation with myself. I don't even know what manifestation is. And so I started researching it and like really putting that belief in myself and I'm forcing myself to sit down and say, where do I see myself as an actor. I envisioned, you know, down to coming through the gates at CBS Radford and, you know, saying hi to security in the morning and being in the makeup chair and all of these things. And shortly after that, the work started coming, the work, the network work started coming. So that was the start of it. I, I started booking All Rise. I was booking uh, Station 19, had recurring roles on these shows, and then the pandemic hit. Um, and auditions started to trickle in as, you know, we were all shut down. Uh, and one came in for Mark Cherry's new show, Why Women Kill, it was season two, and it was a self-tape like any other, and I did it, and I saw that it was gonna be six months work, it was recurring, and I'm like, I really want this. Like, this is Mark Cherry, this is Desperate Housewives, you know? Yeah. And I went into full-on manifestation mode, and I just heard this voice like, don't give up. Don't, and a friend of mine was like, this sounds crazy, but she's like, you know, if you, um, put the name of the show, if you bury it in the ground, it's gonna come to you faster because you're releasing it. And I turned to my partner at the time and I was like, get the shovel. We went in the backyard and we buried it in the, the ground. It was like a whole thing. 
And right when I was ready to lose faith, I called my manager and she's like, oh yeah, I'll call casting. I'll follow up. No problem. And, and I drove back home. And as I got off the exit that night, I looked at my phone and it was the booking details. And I had booked oh. nine out of 10 episodes as a recurring guest oh, star on goodness. this Mark Cherry show that had me working for the next six months at CBS Radford, Crazy. knowing the security guard coming in and the vision that I had made for myself in 2019 completely unfolded right before my eyes. Like it happened exactly the way I wanted it to happen. And it was one of the greatest experiences of my acting career to work amongst women of that caliber to, you know, be able to be on a show written by somebody like Mark Cherry. I remember when you, uh, yeah, when you booked it, that's, that's insane bearing. I never heard that before. Yeah. So you vision something you want it, you go to. bury it. And uh, that's, that's, I mean, it sounds crazy, but It sounds crazy, awesome. but listen, it works. So get the shovel, put it in the yard, do what you got to do. <laughs> what that means is to believe wow. in it so fully and then release it. You have to surrender and trust that it's going to come back to you. If you want it, so you can like over, uh, almost like suffocate it. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. How cool is that, that it was so specific? It was specific. It was the not only gate. the show, the gate, the saying hi to the security guard, like everything. The exact gate that I envisioned myself going through. I even bought a car during the pandemic and I was like this is the car that I'm going to be driving through the CBS gates and then boom I booked it and it all unfolded like that what has that experience done for Cynthia now I mean, as far as confidence I don't mean like financially I'm just saying how is that manifestation and the proof of that power changed you believe in yourself know fully what you want so for a long time I was like I just want to work I just yeah. want to work. Like, I don't care what it is, film, TV, whatever role, like I can do it all. No, you can't. You can't as an actor. You can try. Yes, we can portray different characters, but at the core of who you are, you need to know what that essence is. And for mm. me, it's a strong, smart woman. And so when I narrowed my focus and placed the order with the universe, uh, it all came down the pipe in that way. So you know what you want in life. You know what you're going to go and get. You don't leave that up to other people. It's like going into a guidance counselor's office for the young people and saying, I don't really know what I want to do with my life. What are you thinking? You let, or your parents or anybody, and you let them pick your palate. You should be a lawyer. And then you go on this whole spiral of like doing something you don't like to do. But the idea is to try to find things you love and um, be specific about it, like you're saying, even as an actor, but I feel like for anybody in life, right? Yes, you don't get in the car without knowing where you're going. Right. You don't just get in the car and say, well, the car's gonna take me somewhere, I'll figure it out. Like, you have to know where you're going. How are you gonna get there? And like, and it's, I'm not gonna sit here and act like I just sat down and was like, oh, this is what I wanna do. I wanna be a strong, smart, blah, 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 blah whatever. No, that took, time and energy to right. sit and narrow my focus. That's yeah. not what I want to do. And I am worthy and deserving of asking for what it is that I actually want. So taking the time to, to narrow that down. Cool. Let me ask you this. Um, uh, I'm on a fitness, uh, uh, kick and journey. So I try to include in every podcast, what is fitness living your life? Every day and, and not every day working out in the gym, but like being active every day. For mm -hmm. me, it's a lot of walking. Uh, it's getting those steps in, you know, that 10,000 steps a day is yeah. real. Um, so I walk probably between 20 and 30 miles every week, uh, so whether it's two miles here, four miles there. For me, it's even meditative. Put on music and just go hit the trails, hit the sidewalk, whatever it is. I track on my phone. So most of my fitness, I would say, comes from that. And mindful eating, just being yeah. really aware. Instinctually, I'm like, I have to be mindful of what I eat. And so I... Um, I pay attention to everything that I put in my body now. I see how my body responds and reacts to certain things. So it's just mindfulness. Baby steps throughout the day over time and mm. consistency is, is where it's at. And with that being said, I mean, I have a son. I gained 75 pounds in my pregnancy and lost it all walking. Put wow. the baby in the stroller and hit the trail like as soon as I could. And that was it. There was no... It was either take new headshots and try to work at this high, <laughs> higher weight or like become right. a character actor or get back to where I was. And I just wasn't willing to, uh, to do that. Give that up. So give that up. Nope. So you have a son. That's a good segue. I want to talk a little bit about your, yes. your son. Uh, I, I, I somewhat follow okay. your, your guys' uh, journey together. Um, tell us, your, your son's an actor. My son is an actor as well. My son has been acting since... Uh, 
since he was in utero. I mean, I did a, a, a fashion show on Access Hollywood when I was pregnant with him. So he was on camera in my belly. Nice. He was born. You can get a work permit at 15 days old. He got his work permit at 15 days old and he booked his first job on his own at four months. Wow. And he hasn't stopped working since. He's 11. Uh, he's booked multiple series regs in the last uh, two years. And wow. the kid is just... He's unstoppable, but it, he's had his dry spells too. I mean, he had a few years where nothing was happening and we were driving, you know, four times a week to auditions and eating dinner in the backseat of the car and doing all these things. And you start to ask like, what's it, what's it all for? And then sure enough, stuff started popping off. Um, it was particularly in the pandemic with him as well. And life took us in all kinds of crazy directions that most notably, uh, we lived in Hong Kong together for five months. I was months. just gonna ask that, yeah. He booked a show that uh, is yet to premiere, but will be dropping hopefully soon, yes. playing Nicole Kidman's son. And what? it was uh, an audition just like any other. And the, the breakdown came through and it was a little scene with the kid and the mom. And, you know, we did it. We submitted it. And I remember seeing the location. It said like uh, Hong Kong and uh, Malaysia, I think it was. And I was like, oh, Hong Kong, Malaysia, whatever, you know, submit. Wait. Like, Hong like, Kong, Hong Kong? Hong Kong? Like, let me research a little bit about Hong Kong. Like, I was right. scared, so scared to make that move for him, but for us to leave for five months, I had just wrapped Why Women Kill, and um, I, I was like, I have to do this for him, you know? I mean, I was nervous. I'm going to a foreign country with my kid and setting up shop, yeah. but it all worked out. We did a 21-day hotel quarantine where wow. we couldn't even go in the hallway. It was that strict. What do you think of Hong Kong? It's good. Hong Kong was Did me. you get to spend time at all out because... Yeah. Somebody asked me recently, like, what would be the one thing, the tip you would give for people going to Hong Kong? And it would be don't miss the beaches. The beaches of Hong Kong are incredible. Yeah. And I said that to somebody once and they were like, oh yeah, because that's why you go for the, the beaches. <laughs> like, they, you don't associate Hong Kong with beaches, but they're really gorgeous, like yeah. tropical paradise beaches. So we did that and I made friends with women in the area, you know, just from, I signed up for a yoga studio or whatever it was and infiltrated the local expat community and was hanging out with people, making friends and well, they're still my friends today and it was, it was a great experience. It's incredible. And I'm not going to overlook Nicole Kidman, everybody. I mean, what? You know, so, um, in the show, she's married to uh, Brian T, who is Japanese, Korean blend. So my son is half Filipino, I am Puerto Rican, and I guess that blend was just enough Asian, and there's no white in there, but I guess it worked it, out it worked. that uh, he played Nicole Kidman's wow. son. I was just going to say, some of the young people watching might be like, Nicole Kidman who? No, she's one of the <laughs> biggest movie stars of our time, yeah. a television star, and she's an Academy Award winner. I mean, she's in incredible, yes. and just to work alongside of her was a master class for him wow. in acting. He does a lot of voiceover as well. He um, wow. He's a series reg on this Apple TV animated series called Interrupting Chicken. And then he did a stint on Ada Twist Scientist, which was cool because we grew up reading these books together. And then he voiced a Filipino scientist on this show that's produced by the Obamas. And that led us to have a huge conversation of his impact and his representing his culture on a show that's produced by the Obamas, you know, it was just, it was a huge, it was a huge deal for a kid, you know, I'm like, you should be proud of yourself of all, you know, little Filipino boys across the world are going to see this Filipino scientist on this animated show and think I, maybe I could be a scientist, you know, and inspire hope for those kids. So that was a cool one. That's yeah. cool for you. It's, oh, I was, I'm not going to lie. I huh? was weeping. After the rap party, I'm driving home. I'm like, I'm so proud of you, Bodhi. I was crying. And not because you're an actor, but just because you're a great human being and like everything that you do. Like, it was definitely one of those moments that I was like, wow, I made that. You, it, 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 Bodhi, you're the man. This is young man. You're, you're the young man. This is incredible. But Cynthia, like sitting here with you and feeling the emotions and seeing your eyes water up and, and it, I can't help to think about the little girl that moved from Puerto Rico mm -hmm. to Jersey to the Carolinas that got an intuition to go to South Beach to courage the hard work that we overlooked that she was 16 mm -hmm. and valedictorian of your freaking class. Yeah. We just like skimmed by that. Like that's not one of the biggest, that's a huge deal and says a lot about who you are to go to South Beach 
to San Francisco because of a song by Nella Fatale, which we know it's a lot deeper than it was the song. It was something going on. And then to bring you to L.A. to do your own career. But now look at where you were able to bring your son. Bodhi, not that you're not doing it because you're the man and you're doing it. But look what you've done, Cynthia. And look at what your intuitions and your journey has open gates for. That's That's what our podcast is about. Because if you didn't make those choices, little Bodhi wouldn't be in Hong Kong playing Nicole Kidman's son. Mm -hmm. Now on an Apple show. These are series regulars, by the way, guys. This is the cream of the crop for actors. I mean, all of us actors are here in LA dreaming to become a series regular and, and, you know, be able to show up to work every day. This kid's 11 and he's a series regular on two shows that the Obamas are producing. I mean, the Obamas, like, kudos to you. It's a big deal, but for, you know, Thank you. Kudos to me. I haven't, I've never looked at it from that perspective. And when you say it, it's a little overwhelming. And I'm a little like, wow, I, okay, I guess I did all that. Like, you know, you lose sight of it, I think, when you're in it. Your parents instilled something in you. You're instilling something. You know, Bodhi's going to do what he does. And um, this is a generational. You've changed from your parents not having much. The generation has changed. It's changing and evolving. And that's one of the conversations I think in our country today that um, isn't being talked about enough. Mm -hmm. I think that's important, what I'm hearing from your stories, how important work ethic and hard work is. Everything. Nothing will be given to us without doing the footwork. Um, Let's talk about where you're at today. Um, like, it's not just career-wise, where's Cynthia at? How, what's going on? What, what, um, that's a lot. That's a lot. But what's your daily routine? How do you oh keep balance? The, well, fitness and healthy living, that's mm-hmm. number one. Uh, being a mom is a huge part of it. I mean, at now, this chapter of his life, he's 11, almost 12 and about to go into middle school, which sounds crazy. That sounds crazy. People <laughs> tell you enjoy every moment because it goes so fast. It, that's the truth. It, in the blink of an eye, it happens. This chapter has been for me the most challenging because it's foundational to the rest of his life. He, uh, he's not going to like that. I'm saying this on camera, but he probably won't see this. He's got his first crush on a girl. And like, you know, it's just like navigating who he is as a little man, as a yeah. human being, you know, mom, how do I talk to girls? And like, Also, I just had the realization for all the guys that are watching this, I'm so sorry that the guys have to deal with so much rejection. Like you guys have to put yourself out there constantly, constantly with like any girl that you might be interested in because guys technically make the first move. But like how much rejection comes with that? And like, I don't want to see my baby get rejected. And so it's a little bit hard. And I'm like, I don't even know how to navigate and like steer you in that way. So learning to listen and be there for him as a friend and as an advisor, but not fix it has been really tricky. I have to help him, but knowing that the stuff that happens now is what sets the precedent. I mean, we all have memories of, you know, when you were 11, 13, 15, high school, whatever, like that's the foundation of you in your relationships, of you, you know, how you show up in your friendships and in life. So it's a big challenge. It's a big responsibility to make sure that I'm steering him in the right way during this time. Yeah, yeah. And then also, like I said, the, the work ethic, that's that's huge. There's times that he doesn't, he's 11, and there's times he doesn't want to do anything, you know? And for me, that's not an option. Like, he knows that doing nothing is not an option. Right. To say, well, I, I don't want to act, that's fine, you don't have to. I'm, I'm not a stage mom, I have my own thing going. But for you to say, I don't want to do this, I'm just going to sit and chill and watch YouTube and play video games, not an option. Not going to happen. Not on my watch. What, what is the other thing you're going to do? Is it you want to play sports? You want to, you know, whatever. Right. You got to do something. Mm. You can't just sit around and be, there's so much time built in to chill. And I really implemented that in him. It's like you enjoy that chill time more when you have something going on. Then yeah. you can go chill. You know, like you got to You got to earn the chill. You got to earn the chill. That's yeah. how I've, I've always seen it, you know. Uh, helping him realize that he's blessed and fortunate to have a savings account and a setup that when he turns 18, he's not going to be like everybody else hitting the street in pursuit of the dream, trying to figure it all out. Like he has a a path that's laid out. Does he have to take it? No, but at least there's a a starter bunch for whatever it is he chooses to do. The elephant in the room with kid actors, right? I, I, um, there's such a stigma, right? When you see these uh, kid actors, mm-hmm. like from the Corey Haynes and mm-hmm. the Feldmans and the uh, you know Drew Barrymores and the, you know, we see what happens a lot of times when kids get famous young. Uh, are, are you are you 
very conscious of that and <coughs> prepped on that, how to keep him from uh, becoming his own worst. Of course. You know. Yeah, I keep him grounded. And it's like, it, it's he's just a normal kid, you mm. know? There's no, uh, there's special treatment he's on set and all of that. But yeah. I mean, I'm not, again, one of those stage moms. It's like, I have seen instances over his career where I've seen kids strapped to the stroller. The casting is over. The, the, everybody's gone and the kid doesn't want to do it. And the parents are like yelling at the kid in the stroller and, you know, wow. calling the other mom and trying to figure out how to get the kid to perform. And I'm thinking, that's your point where you need to leave. That kid doesn't want to be there. Casting can see the kid doesn't want to be there. Like, you know, or parents take the kid out before they go, right before they go in the room and say, we need this. We have bills to pay. Oh, and they put the kid wow. in the room and you're just like, as a performer with that kind of a pressure, can you imagine that you're like, the weight of the world is on your shoulders? And I think that's part of why these kids, this happens, you know, they, they go in the wrong direction. But with mine, it's, it's I'm, I'm a Puerto Rican mom, so I'm, I'm, pretty, uh, I'm pretty strict when it comes to, to things in life and like there's no wiggle room. So, you know, I keep a close watch uh, on set. He, they're not even allowed to go anywhere by themselves. You can't even send them into hair and makeup alone. You have to be there with them, but I am his advocate. You know, there's experiences from five years old where he was doing a film and they wanted him to do something that I felt was risky. And I said, no, he's not gonna do that. I would jump in and say, no, he's not gonna do that because we get hurt on set doing things. And, right. and as a performer, you're like, I'll do it. Sure, no problem. But you have to advocate for, for your kids. And so I'm just leading by example, I guess, so that he sees, you know, how we show up and that it, there's no entitlement here. You know, yeah. you're not the prince. When you're on set, you're treated as such and deservingly so. Mm. But when it's cut, that's that's that. I'm the director. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> I'm the director in life. And it sounds like he's you're, you're doing it because it's fun for him, it is. right? Yeah. Because I just watched that Brooke Shields um, documentary. I think it was Netflix or Hulu or something, but but I didn't know all that trauma yeah. as a child mm -hmm. actor and what her, her, the close relationship her and her mom had, but um, her mom, you know, uh, you know, not a spoiler, but was an alcoholic and was like, basically she needed her to do these sex scenes at eight and, wow. you know, lose her virginity on camera at, not really, but in the scene she was, losing a virginity, but she, Brooke Shields was like, I didn't even know what virginity was, and I'm wow. already playing these roles. And directors were like pinching her toe during the sex scene, she's 12. Yeah. So she would really scream to make it real. And it's like horrifying when you're like, how far we could get in the method of acting. Yeah. As adults, I understand we get a little bit, sometimes we, but as kids, you're like, whoa. So the reason I'm bringing all that up doesn't sound like that's the experience. You're very well put, you have your own career, you, yeah. you're taking care of yourself, your mental health is good. So with Bodhi, it's, it sounds healthy and you guys are doing this together as a team and you're enjoying the craft. It's yeah. not like you have to do this. No, he doesn't so, have to do anything. Well, he has to do something, but he doesn't have to do acting or right. showbiz or anything in the industry. But the option of doing nothing is not on the table. I like that's that. That's just not how we operate. So like you said earlier, if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, this is how I grew up was like, you have to, nobody's going to come do it for you. Nobody's going to knock on the door and say, here's, you know, your money, here's your career, here's whatever it is. You have to go out there and get it. And so yeah. I, that's important for me to uh, instill in him. So I just screen everything that comes his way, whatever project it is, whoever the players are. And I'm always there within I shot of, you know, the, the scene. Right. I'm the one, like, don't be afraid to get in there and be next to the monitor and watch what's going on or whatever it is. You know, a lot of parents, they, they don't want to rock the boat or, yeah. you know, yeah. even early people that are actors and performers, you just kind of, you want to lay back and whatever works for you and you don't advocate for yourself. But I think especially when it comes to my, my child, get in there and watch that monitor. You're not, they'll tell you if you're standing in the wrong place and they'll put you in a place that's appropriate for you to watch. Right. But don't be the one that just says, oh no, they're fine. They got them, they got them. I'm gonna go sit in the trailer. I'm gonna go hide. No, you exactly. have to be watching constantly. That's what I wanted to steer it to. That's good. I guess that's what I was trying to say for parent, for anybody watching who has a kid and they're like, you know what? I, I think my kid's talented and, um, the horror stories, <clears throat> and this is for anybody, even actresses or actors mm -hmm. out there, um, 
there's so many horror stories about Hollywood, right? Meeting a producer in a hotel oh, yeah, a- alone at night. And it's like, it's like you're not going to let that happen with your kid. And another thing I would like to add, not that um, if you're ever in that position as an actor or you get into this field and someone says, hey, meet me, you know, at the Motel 6 or at the Beverly Wilshire, it don't matter where, at 2 in the morning, clearly. It's the common sense issue, right? It's like... Uh, Clearly, that's not a good idea, and that's not professional. So you wouldn't even want a job that's attached to that kind of a sacrifice. Um, that, yes. Have you done 2 a.m. meetings? I, no, I haven't. The, what I was going to say is that it's not always that obvious. And I remember going to the audition, and the agent sent me the breakdown, my agent at the time, and said, uh, be sure to wear a short skirt that's going to go further with these producers. And I was just kind of like, okay, a short skirt. Maybe that, that works for the character. And I, I put on my little short skirt and I went for the audition and it was off of, I think it was Santa Monica Boulevard, like East LA or something like that, East Hollywood. Yeah. And I remember walking, I feel so silly saying this now at the time, I walked past these guys and they were like, damn girl, where you work? And I was like, <laughs> what? Oh <laughs> and I went into the audition and now I look back and I'm like, I think they thought I was a prostitute because <laughs> where do I work? Like they weren't asking my place of employment, that's for sure. And I went in and I did the audition and I got the callback and it was like a whole situation. And that same producer, when I did the callback, I remember there was tears streaming down my face and I'm avenging my father's death. And it was the director loved it. And the producer was not, he wasn't feeling me for whatever reason. And he's like, are you, are you always this serious? And I was like, I'm wiping the tears. I'm thinking I'm supposed to be serious. That's what this role is. And it was like, uh, uh, oh, you know, we'll be in touch. And I left and I could tell he wasn't. And I'm like thinking, do you want me to like sit on your lap and giggle? Like, what is that? That's, yeah, not, that's yeah. not what this character is. That's not, but it was one of those situations that I look back now and I'm like, from the beginning, I should have known a short skirt is going to go a long way with this producer. Like, it's probably not the position right. that I want to be in. You don't know in this business. You don't. It is such a fragile, scary yeah. place. And that was before I had an agent or I was SAG or this is in the beginning of me being like, I'm going to be an yeah. actor. Be mindful, be 100%. careful, um, find mentors in the business, find people you trust. If you're a young man out there, I, I mean, any age, but I'm saying if you're a young person out there, young woman, find mentors when you do decide to get into this business. And, uh, and that goes for any career you're in and always remember if it feels uncomfortable halt if it's the right thing it's never going to be um, a bad thing to halt and when uh, you find your mentors they're not always your agent and your manager make sure that you are the final say on what works for you you can't just trust the agent and the manager because it, there's been many situations where they're not steering you in the right direction one thing i wanted to um uh, point out too was about what we're talking about with the agents and the managers and um, that's a great another great thing I want to say no matter what career especially here though because we're talking about Hollywood but any career it's like people people always have themselves in mind like their own interior motive if you're a young actor coming that's a great point and the advice I always give is yes in the beginning indie stuff stay away from nudity so i mean you got to decide what project's right for you but what you just said is you want to see the long picture and everything you've been talking about cynthia visualizing your success you're going to be a big actor if you're coming into this my belief is i'm a craftsman i come from the theater i believe in the work and learning the real structure of being an actor and how to break down scripts and beats but with that said my dream was always to make it. I didn't come in like some of my friends like, oh, I just want to like work. And I'm like, not me. Um, and I may never make it. My point is, but I wanted to. When I started, it was like, no, I want to be famous. I yeah. want to like be successful. So I think everyone should have that. Like, so think about the work you take in the beginning when some young non-union, you're not in SAG yet, and you're like, man, I just, I, each job leads to a job. Be careful with that. So it is a very delicate uh, journey, and uh, but 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 it's worth doing. I would say I don't regret. Um, am I DiCaprio? No, um, but I don't regret it. Um, I love creating, and I think if you're young and and you think you love creating, absolutely. I want to jump back on uh, a question about Bodhi mm -hmm. uh, before we wrap up. Um, education was kind of a uh, 
lingering. You, you talked about your son and um, his success already, which is incredible. And probably financially, he's doing really well. Um, how does education land? Where do you, where do you think, uh, are you, is he going to steer towards a, a university or? So like I said, I, I graduated top of my class. So for me, education's always been super important. I'm, I'm a bit of not a bit, I'm a full-blown nerd, and I'm proud to say so. I think at one point it was like, oh, nerd. I've had people like, don't say that about yourself. And I'm like, no, I am. I'm a nerd. Like, I like to research and like read, and like, and he is very much my, my mini-me. He's, he's all about reading and educating himself, but school is of the, the utmost priority. Like, he's top of his class now that he's back in regular school, uh, but always has been. It, you know your limitations of your own child and how hard you can push them. And for me, that comes in play of, of an audition. Of I know that he, he has more to give. Other kids, maybe that's, that's tapped out. But for school also, how hard you can push your child. And for him, he has a very high... Uh, threshold. He likes to be challenged. It's actually, it's hard to stay ahead of him because he is so intelligent. Um, but so school's always been super important, you know? Uh, yeah. They have tutors and things like that on set when he has been on set working. Uh, but even that, again, I have to be the advocate for the schoolwork that he's doing. If the teacher gives him work for a week's worth of job and he's leaving school and I don't think it's enough work, I'm going to go back and say this is not enough to, to mm. fill his time, you know? So it's very important to us. Uh, as far as university and colleges and things, like I said, his aspirations now are writer-director. He's also recently gotten into music production, creating his own songs. He writes full-blown screenplays on wow. final drafts. Uh, so he's going into more of an artistic uh, lane where that will, whether it's animation, whether it's music, or whatever is to be determined, he has to figure that out on his own. Uh, so if he did want to go to a school accordingly, I would facilitate that. Uh, so we'll see what he wants to do at the age right. of 18 when he's done with high school and whether or not that takes him to university or if he goes straight to work, you know. Right. But it'll probably be something creative. Um, and he's learning every day, you know. It's never an option for him to, to school to take a back seat for a job, a TV show or a film or whatever. Like, I see the, the bigger picture. Right now, it seems as if it's going to be an artistic thing. I mean, I he did a filmmaker's camp last year, and this year I'm looking into the New York Film Academy for a summer camp, whatever yeah. whatever he might be interested in. So I educate him on top of the education that he already gets, you know, the required schooling in whatever area of creativity that he might be interested in. Yeah, it sounds like he's got the gift and, and the arts are important and the world needs yeah. more artists always, right? So and he does it and he knows he can't be lazy about it. He's, he's going into middle school. He wants to be in the video production team. Wow. And we did his, uh, they asked for a two minute video of him talking about himself. So most kids, you put the little cell phone and you talk for two minutes. And I said, this is an opportunity for you to show them your video production skills. Let's edit this video. Let's shoot it in a creative way, you know, set up the studio. I want you to edit it. I want a title card. I want some animation in there. I want you to pop up pictures as you're talking about things. Let's do it. Like, don't play safe. I think because he's always been in the spotlight too, he's dimming the light. Like, I don't want to stand out too much, mom. And I don't want to make people feel like, you know, whatever. Yeah, less than. I, I said, don't ever dim your light. Don't, you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how to turn that up. So, and you will never be dim enough for the average person. You just won't. And if you're an exceptional human being, you can try your hardest to just be a ho-hum, whatever. People will see through that. Yeah. So I'm like, turn that light all the way up and shine bright and be the best that you can be. And if people can't handle it, then that's on them. But you will inspire people and there'll be people that'll gravitate towards that light and want to be around it, you know, so. Well, it sounds like you've, uh, uh, you are more than fortunate. It sounds like you're, you're doing the job that's been put in front of you, I'm not just as best. a mother, but as a woman, as a, uh, a member of society. I mean, you're doing it all, man. You're an inspiration. Thank you. It's been an honor to have you. I feel like I'm not doing enough now. Like that speech right there, like with the editing and stuff, I'm looking at my whole, my team here, like guys, let's get better product. What's going on? She just got me like, we need like title cards That's and we it. need to open right. And we need to inspire people. Um, you want a job? <laughs> um, it's been an honor to have you. you on. Everybody, you. Cynthia Keeley, look her up, check her out. Her work is exceptional. Um, 
I hope you got some out of today's episode. Uh, I know I did. Every time I do these, uh, I, co- I come out of them a little more knowledgeable and a little more motivated. I hope that's doing the same for you. This is the FYI podcast. Follow your inspiration. This is where we find our inspiration and we follow it. So don't forget to do that. We could do anything we put our minds to. That's not just a cheap slogan. It's truth. It's fact. Every guest I bring on is doing the things they talk about. So I encourage you to find them. Look her up. Do you have a handle they can look at? Instagram or? At Cynthia.Quiles. Q-U-I-L-E-S. Follow Cynthia. If you have any questions, I'm sure she doesn't mind if you reach out to her. Ding, 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 ding. Hit me up. (laughs) Hit her up. Um, Listen, I love y'all. I hope you love me back. And I'll see you on the next one. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Okay, on the next episode, we have Deborah Farmer. She's an author and she's an advocate of adoption. Don't miss this next episode. You should never stress about the problems you be facing. Everybody in the mud on the struggle trying to make it. Look into the mirror and you see the motivation. Then you step into the world and you find your inspiration. I'm finding inspiration. And once I get a hold of it, I'll never get complacent. Look into the mirror and you see the motivation. Then you step into the world and you find your inspiration.